I think it is a, a very brave thing to begin a Monday morning by talking about data, but this is how we are going to begin. So thank you very much for inviting me and uh, asking me here to speak about data and innovation. And I believe that data gives us the ability to perceive things about the world that we otherwise would not be able to access or understand. In that way, it gives us a superpower. It also, when we build products, gives us an ability to impact the world at a scale and in a way that we as lone human beings otherwise could not possibly impact. And so it is something that I'm very excited about. Uh, it is a great time to be building applications and building things on data and on the internet. Before I begin, I'd love to share with you one of my favorite things from the internet, and just to set the stage for how we interact with and understand technology in our lives today. Just to say, it is the year 2015, it is almost 2016, um, and this is how we use the internet. So how many people here like Reddit? Anyone? A few? Okay. So I consider Reddit to be very much like the armpit of social media in the sense that it is very weird. <laughs> it is a very bizarre place, but some very funny, wonderful things come out of it. And one of these things is someone asking this question. So if someone from the 1950s suddenly appeared here today, what would be the most difficult thing to explain to them about life today? And here's the best answer. I possess a device in my pocket that is capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man. I use it to look at pictures of cats and get in arguments with strangers. <laughs> <laughs> and this tells us that technology is changing very quickly, um, but people, human nature, stays the same. And here's another example I love very much. So this is President Obama on the campaign trail. Uh, in this photo, he's in Germany. And you see here in this photo, very much like this audience, every single person has a device. Every single person has a camera, a phone, uh, even here someone with a laptop saying, you know, hello. Um, this shows that we are intermediating our communication with technology and we are collecting data from every interaction. And that data can be put to use for us. And we live in this future today there is a wonderful Tumblr blog called We Put a Chip in It, and I know there is an IoT hackathon, so if you're into that stuff and you have not seen this, you must check it out. Um, this is a project from that blog where somebody decided to create an LED disco dance suit for their dog, um, and I share this with you because it is wonderful and adorable and cute, but also because this shows where we are in the development of our technology. It has gotten so cheap and so easy that we can play with it. And this is where we are with data today. It is something that, uh, that has become so affordable that anyone can start to build products and applications on it. And so it's a very exciting time now to be doing these things. Now I want to demystify some of the vocabulary and the words we use about data. I do not like the term big data because you don't know how big it has to be. Some people think big data no longer fits in Microsoft Excel. Um, that it, you know, engineers often say, well, it's data that is so big, you require special computers to interact with it. You cannot load it up on one, one machine, but I can tell you that the data I can analyze on my laptop in my bag over there is, is more powerful this year than it was last year than it was before. Um, so I like to think of big data as data actually made useful, meaning that you, can, you have the technical capability to ask a question of the data and get the answer back before you forget why you asked the question in the first place. So it is data that is made useful to human beings to make decisions. And these data products, Things built on top of this data are everywhere already today. And I'll show you some of my favorite examples. The first one is an application called Foursquare. Does anyone use this here? Is it a, yes, okay, I see a few. 
Um, so it, they've done a wonderful job of building a product that collects data. So the first version was a game where you check into a restaurant or a venue. And the second version, they said, now we have all this data. We know the signal strength from the phone when you're in this location versus that location. We know what um, people are talking about and ordering in a space. And so they took the data from the first version. They built a new version. And now when I walk into a restaurant, even here in Stockholm, it says, we know where you are. And by the way, you should try the cheeseburger. It's really good. Um, because it knows what I like. And so they've done a wonderful job of iterating on data collection, new product, and building products that are only possible because of the data they've collected before. Another example, which I, I think people here will like, is called Dark Sky. And this, this application takes, uh, at least in the US, they use public government data. Outside the US, they use other data for the weather. They take your GPS location from your smartphone, and they make a weather prediction for where you are standing right now. And they say, it is going to rain on you in 10 minutes. It's a very useful application. It allows you to make good decisions. So in New York, where I come from, if it says it's going to rain in 10 minutes, that is just enough time to run to the subway and go home. Um, so it's very useful. The third product I wanted to share is one that's a little bit different. So this is a, a story about work done by a woman named Lauren Talbot in the New York City Mayor's Office of Analytics, where you know, they looked at uh, ambulances and how long it took for a call to 911 to send an ambulance when there's a medical emergency. And this is a wonderful project because it involves no fancy mathematics, no fancy algorithms, just taking data from one place, data from another place, and putting it together. And they did two things that were quite remarkable. The first one is when you call, they ask many questions. They say, what's, what kind of emergency? What's happening? They change the order of the questions to optimize the response time to hand it off to the ambulance as soon as possible. And that was a, a very simple statistics project. And the other thing they did was look, because the ambulances wait in the city. They drive around. And they found out, of course, they don't go to the optimal point for each precinct. They sort of go wherever they want. And they said, uh, well, we can calculate where they should wait and how they should go based on the prediction of where the calls will come. Why don't they do that? And instead of uh, you know, just telling them what to do, they actually went and talked to the ambulance drivers. And what the drivers said, was that they, they go where they go because there are 24-hour cafes with bathrooms and coffee. And so they found them better locations for their cafes. And it turns out that between these two things, they cut the response time of ambulances down by one minute in New York City. This is a big deal. It is saving a lot of lives. And I share this story because it's a, it's a nice data outcome. But also, if the New York City government can do it, anybody can do it. So there is no excuse not to try. And the last data product I want to share is uh, Google Maps with traffic view turned on. And I will ask, what is the most remarkable thing about Google Maps traffic view? It's very boring. <laughs> And that is why it is so good, because this is a data product with an incredible amount of technology behind it. They are doing prediction based on historical data about what the traffic will look like. They are collecting real-time data from phones and devices running Google Maps out in the world right now. They're integrating it all together and visualizing it in a way that anyone can understand. You can read this map. Even if you don't know this city, you can say, OK, I know where to go. Um, and yet, it is so boring. You don't have to think about any of that to use this product. And that's what makes it so good and so successful, that you can use it without any awareness of the technology behind it. And so why all these data products today and not 30 years ago? Well, today we have computational power we can afford. So this is a picture of ENIAC from 1947, which was 150 feet long with 20 banks of lights. Um, and your phone today is much more powerful than this. We have a lot of data. So we are collecting data. Uh, in many cases, it is cheaper to collect data than to throw it away. And this is a, a significant change. 
And the last thing is we know what to do with the data once we have it. So we have the mathematical and computational tools to work with data. And while everybody likes to think their data is unique and special, um, it is, in fact, the case that most human beings are very similar. We're very boring. And that is a good thing for figuring out how to analyze the data we generate. But this is not really a technical problem, not only a technical problem in any case. It's a human problem. So we have data, we have software, we have hardware, uh, we have you know, human beings and product design. How do we fit it all together? And we've seen this emergence of a new job. And this new job is data science. And it is three things that are not traditionally put in the same profession. So in the past, you could have a job doing any one of these things, but it was so hard to do each one that it was still its own role. Today, you can have one person, one job, that does three things. So they do mathematics and statistics. They do programming. They write code. They make, make the software work. And the hardest part is the communication part. And so to give you an example, what a very good data scientist can do is sit down with anyone and say, what are you trying to understand about the world? What problem are you trying to solve? They can go away. They can program something up with the data and the technology they have. And then they go back to that first person and they explain to them what they learn so that other person makes a good decision. And when I describe data science this way, it becomes clear that it is not necessarily the mathematics, statistics, or programming that is hard. It is the empathy and the human understanding to know what questions to ask, what kinds of answers to find, and how to share and communicate those answers that is really challenging. And so we see lots of people in these new jobs. Um, over the last five years, it's been expanding rapidly, and you can now even get an academic degree in data science, which is amazing. And it is not just the people doing the work that have to change. The managers have to change. They have to uh, grow up. You need new process around management. Um, if you are very interested in process around management, I co-authored a very short free ebook with DJ Patil, who is now the chief data scientist for the White House on process and management of data. So please help yourself and uh, let us know if you have any questions. Um, but it's really about how you go from thinking about data as a separate um, obligation and a cost to how you use it to build new things, and it's a source of excitement and revenue. And I find in the work I do today, the biggest opportunities for data are often surprising. We like to think it is uh, startups and uh, you know hackers who have all the opportunity. But in fact, many big companies have opportunity also. So big companies have been running businesses and collecting data for many years. Um, generally, they know those businesses very well. And so even if you're not in a startup, there is no excuse not to try. Do something new with the data. And if you put all this together, you start to see these very interesting data products emerge. So it's a combination of data, which you probably have already, so you get that for free, technology, which is changing quickly, and I'll speak more about that in a moment, and then the people, the data scientists, the managers, the product designers working together, all of these things together let you build products. And if you want to see where this is happening today, this is a machine intelligence landscape from Siobhan Zillis, who's a venture capitalist at Bloomberg Beta in San Francisco. And what she's done is taken many of the different technology capabilities and broken down the areas where you can find them. And today we see things in very defined domains. You see a lot of data products in finance, um, in pharmaceuticals, in security, in agriculture. But these are capabilities that are becoming cheaper and more accessible, and we will see them next uh, in, in more broad applications like consumer internet. It's a pretty exciting time to be looking at this stuff. And they're changing very quickly, which is exciting. So I work in this area called AI, artificial intelligence or machine intelligence. And the joke that we tell is that AI is whatever a computer cannot do today. 
And in 1997, Garry Kasparov was defeated by Deep Blue playing chess, and so then AI could not play chess. AI can play chess, of course. And today, the best chess players in the world are not humans. They are not AI programs. They are the two working together, um, because you are able to have the machine ability to forecast and predict combined with the human creativity and ability to make decisions. Um, and that's the best chess player in the world today. And of course, AI cannot drive a car, but um, a few years ago, Google released the self-driving car. We still don't have one, but um, hopefully we will someday. And then all of a sudden, AI can drive a car. Now, to be entirely fair, the specific technical problem that the car is solving on the road is very different than what we do when we drive as human beings but it's still a remarkable achievement for artificial intelligence. So now AI can drive cars. So I want to look at what is next um, and end this talk with the, a discussion about the technical capabilities that are changing, that are new, and how we get there. Because we see things moving from rules-based and repetitive to uh, statistical and probabilistic to creative, things that we would not have thought a machine could do even three or four years ago. And this is what we work on at my company. We sit in the middle of this community of researchers and professors, of startups and people building new applications, and companies that want to build new applications and connect with these other communities. And we look at many different technologies, and I wanted to share how we choose what will be interesting or how we find these things. And the first step, of course, is to get up early, drink a lot of coffee, read a lot of books, have many ideas, and anyone can do that. And the next step is to look for changes that make this technology more possible this year than it was last year. And the first thing that happens is potentially a theoretical breakthrough. So somebody has done some research that makes it more possible to solve a problem than it was before. Sometimes it was uh, an incremental research, so someone solves a problem in one field, but if you look at it, you can say, wow, that actually applies in, you know, in machine learning or in the internet field as well. Um, so it's not always eureka moments, it's progress in research. The second thing is a change in the economics of the, the constraints of using a certain technique. And I'll give you an example. I can make any graph of CPU cost, GPU cost, memory cost, hard drive cost, and it looks like the same graph. It's just linear decline. And so if you want to do something, but it's too expensive, you just wait. <laughs> and you can see, <laughs> one year or two years, you'll be able to do this thing. Um, here's another example I love, because this one shows from 2005, the SD card has 128 megabytes. In 2014, that same SD card, the same cost, had 128 gigabytes. And these are orders of magnitude changes, which just make things affordable to a much wider audience. And this is why you see things start in fields that have a lot of money, like finance and pharmaceuticals and chemistry, and then move into fields like the internet, where we don't have a lot of money all the time. The third thing we look for is open source and things becoming commodities. So we look for things like Hadoop, where before this software exists, if you wanted to do a large-scale distributed MapReduce calculation, you had to hire 20 engineers and build the whole thing yourself. Once Hadoop is in the open source community, you need maybe two engineers to install and configure it. It was one of those systems that required a lot of love in the beginning. Um, and today, if you want to use this, you go to your laptop, you bring up the command line, and you type one command to Amazon Web Services, and you have a cluster of machines just waiting for you. So now, instead of being something you have to build yourself, it's something you can build on top of with no additional effort. Sometimes things become commodities and then become uncommodities. So in 2007, Facebook acquired a company called Face.com. Uh, Face.com had the world's best facial recognition software. So put in a photo of a person, it says, this is Hillary. Um, and all of these people had built on top of it, and then it just went away. So it was uh, not a very good outcome, which is why we like open source. And now if you go to face.com today, it looks like this, and who knows what that is. 
Um, the last thing we look for is that new data has become available that makes it possible to try something in an area where you couldn't before. And I have Wikipedia up for two reasons, because Wikipedia is the dirty secret of data science. Every data scientist project using uh, language is in some way using Wikipedia data. This is also why you see so many more open source data projects that are in English than any other language, because Wikipedia data is easy to use in English. There's much more of it. And so you can actually trace um, why this is the way it is. It's not good. Um, and the other part of this is that data, which might exist, is made useful. So here is a project from ProPublica that I love very much. And so this is a project where they took data from the US government, which was in terrible shape. It was ugly. It was a mess. They cleaned it up. And they made it so that if you're getting a medical procedure, you can see the success of your doctor. Um, and they made it very easy to use and understand. Um, and so this is an example of the data existed, but there was a huge amount of work to use it. And then they cleaned it up and made it very easy to use and understand. It's a fantastic project. Very easy data visualization as well. And so a few things that we're very excited about, just to end on the, the fun stuff, one of them is called natural language generation. And this is the technology for taking structured data and generating articles. So computers that write uh, language. And in order to demonstrate this, we built a system that writes real estate advertisements, just like a human being does. So you say, I want to sell a two-bedroom, two-bathroom house, and it's in this location or this neighborhood, and it has these features, and it writes the advertisement for you. And so this is all automatically generated. We did this not we don't work in real estate, but it's a very good example of structured data, so numbers to language. Um, and this capability is something you can now use much more broadly. So we've seen it um, show up in everything from celebrity gossip news. So if Kim Kardashian wears a sweater, the two paragraphs about that may be written by software is probably good. Um, and then things like uh, doing sales team success reporting, showing up all over uh, different places. But it's a very exciting technology, and it's pretty much uh, only become very useful in the last two years. Another thing we do a lot of work with is probabilistic methods for real-time data, and especially if you're interested in Internet of Things or IoT. Um, you will need to deal with sensor data, with lots of data in the stream. And these are techniques that allow you to do so in a CPU and memory constrained way. So rather than taking your data in a batch and iterating through it many times to come up with a calculation, which is slow, you just take the data as it comes in the stream and you look at each point one time and then maintain an online model of what you want to understand. And so to demonstrate this sort of thing, we take data from Twitter and Reddit, which is a nice stream of language, of comments. And you can see things uh, always in social media that are quite funny. So here we have shower thoughts. What people think about in the shower is uh, you know, overlapping with the language of why I'm single, which I cannot explain, but it's happening at the moment I took this screenshot. Um, it is the internet, and the internet is like this. The last one I want to share is on uh, image recognition, which is one of the, the truly interesting things happening this year. So when I list those four things about, you know, data is available, becomes a commodity, the costs come down, there's a breakthrough. Um, image analysis with deep learning hits all of those things all at the same time. So this is something where you are taking a picture and you are automatically figuring out what is in the picture. So a system that can say there is a puppy and a cup of coffee in this photo automatically with no human intervention at all. And this uses a very old technique called the perceptron, which was actually pioneered in the 1960s at Cornell University in the aeronautics lab. I learned an amazing thing about this when we did this project, which is that the first perceptron was not just math, it was not just software, it was actually built in hardware, 
um, where the weights in the neural network were potentiometers, and they had actual motors that moved them around during the training process, which is amazing. Um, but the core mathematics remain quite simple. It's really just having inputs that are zero and ones, and uh, weights, you add them up, you have some rules, and you have an output. And this leads to things like this. This is Google Deep Dream. If you have not seen it, it is very disturbing. Um, but this is a, a photo where they have reversed the process. So this is Jennifer Lawrence, the actress. And then the photo shows you what the algorithm learned to recognize. So it learned to recognize eyes and mouths and ears and some other weird things. We made a thing that is much more easy to understand and to use. Um, this is called Pictograph, where if you use Instagram, you can give it your Instagram account, and it will make a visualization of what you like to take pictures of just by looking in the pictures. Um, and if you like dogs or cats, it is very good at dogs and cats. You should definitely try it. It's pictograph.us. And so I, I don't want to end on purely, purely optimistic note. One of the things we spend a lot of time doing at my company is helping people think about what goes wrong. Um, and it is, uh, there are really two big topics in, in the data science field right now that people are thinking a lot about. And the first one is really the usability and the product design aspects of building machine learning products. So how do you go through a product design process when you don't even know what the system will look like, what it can do, and that's a lot of fun and a, a very exciting topic at the moment. The second topic is what do we do when, uh, when these systems are not ethical, when these systems somehow encode bias because there is bias in the data. And I can tell you, even in our project, we found some very funny errors. So when I take pictures uh, in the New York City subway and put it into our image recognizer, it tells me they are a prison or a jail because there is no training data for the New York City subway, and it does look a little bit like a jail. Um, but that's, you know, it's funny, and it's a, a good outcome to see, but if you can imagine how that could go very wrong in a, a product where someone's trying to sell it, and in fact, it has gone wrong, um, there have been issues where Google has used the same technology and mislabeled photos in very offensive ways. Same for, uh, for Flickr and some of the other systems using the technique. So we try very hard to keep people thinking about the products they build and to help them realize that they're responsible for what those products do in the world. And they should build things that make the world that they want to live in. And this happens all the time. So this is a friend of mine who's a data scientist. So he said, you know, he tweeted about a software project called Wrangler for cleaning up data. And now he's getting so many ads for jeans and pants. It means lots of opportunity for us, I suppose. And we are really just at the beginning of seeing these capabilities in the products we use every day and in the real world. And so I think that if we come back to this event in five years, almost every product we see will use data intelligently, um, not just for reporting on business success, but for actually enabling pieces of the product. And what we call AI or machine learning today will be a core part of many of the things we are going to build. And so thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, I believe we have a few minutes, yes? Thank you. Thank you very much, Hilary. Thank you. It was really interesting and, and a lot of fun you found there. <laughs> but, uh, and, you know, I'm working with information security. And, and I don't want to be a party pooper, but do you have any understanding of the concern f people feel about big data and privacy? And Absolutely. how will we cope with that? I mean, I like gadgets. <laughs> So the, the issue with data and privacy is that um, right now systems collect data about us. They store it, they uh, learn things from it, they sell it to other people, and we as consumers, as individuals, have no right to know what that data is, where it goes, um, what people may assume about us, and it's very often incorrect. 
Uh, for example, if you, Google has a page where you can see what they think you are like for advertisers, and it tells me I'm a 25-year-old man, probably because I read about programming so much. It's obviously very wrong. Um, and so these are, are big problems mm -hmm. um, that we need to fix at a, a legislative level, at a um, society level, and also by um, making good decisions about if you build a product, if you build a system, don't be that person. <laughs> Just uh, be very clear with the, the people that, that use your product about what data you collect and where it goes, and don't sell it to third parties. Good advice. Thank Great. you. Thank you. So please stay on stage. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. And uh, true to our tradition here at the Internet Dagana, we have prepared a very unique gift for you. We even have a movie to introduce it. Please oh partake. Gosh. We at the Internet Foundation in Sweden love makers and believe that knowledge provides new possibilities. A few months ago, a young maker got arrested for taking his home-built clock to school. This is not how the world should be. So we let a bunch of 14-year-olds build their own clocks as gifts for our keynote speakers. Young minds like this strengthen our belief that the Internet should be both free and open for all. And so we say thank you with our own special custom-made clock. <laughs> thank you. And um, hopefully this will not cause you too much trouble in customs when you travel home in the airport. I will take this <laughs> home very proudly. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you thank very you. much. <laughs>